Swami Vivekananda, born Narendranath Datta, Naren as he was called for short, was born in the northern district of Calcutta on January 12, 1863. His father, Vishwanath, an attorney of the High Court of Calcutta, was an agnostic who was inclined to make fun of religion, though in a gentle, civilized manner. He earned a great deal of money and spent as much, leaving just about a huge litigated house and nothing much on his death. In his youth, Narain had become a temporary disciple of John Stuart Mill and Herbert Spencer and was beginning to call himself an agnostic. When the principal of the General Assembly's institution, later known as the Scottish Church College, Professor W. W. Hasty, an Englishman who, while lecturing on Wordsworth's poem, The Excursion, and the poet's nature mysticism, referred to the saint of Dakineshwar and said, I have known only one person who has achieved such meditation. And that is Ramakrishna of Dakineshwar. You'll understand better if you visit this saint. Among the students who heard Professor Hasti, it was Narain who made the trip, and the rest is history. Years later, the great disciple of Swami Vivekananda, Sister Nivedita, was to describe the Calcutta monastery of the order of Ramakrishna. It was among the loans and trees of the Ganges side that I came to know, in a personal sense, the leader to whose work my life was already given. At the time of landing in India, the ground and building had just been purchased at Belu, which were afterwards to be transformed into the Calcutta Monastery. A mile or so further up the eastern bank, could be seen the towers and trees of Dokineshwar, that temple garden in which the Swami and his brothers had once been boys at the feet of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. To our cottage here then came the Swami daily, at sunrise, alone or accompanied by some of his brothers. And here, under the trees, Long after our early breakfast was ended, we might still be found seated, listening to that inexhaustible flow of interpretation in which he would reveal to us some of the deepest secrets of the Indian world. In his early youth, Swami Vivekananda had traveled the distances of the Indian world to know about the realities of his country. And understanding the wealth of the experience required meditation. So, at the end of one such journey, as Parivrajika, he swam from the southernmost tip of India to the unnamed rock, to sit there and meditate on God, the duties of a sannyasin, and on India and her problems. That rock today is known as Vivekananda Rock.
His search for a deeper sense of India took Swamiji to some of the sublime spiritual spots of India, like Varanasi. There, Kithi Mohan Sen had heard the Swami singing a song of Rabindranath Tagore, his great contemporary. <laughs> Another of his favorite places of meditation and self-education was the hills of Almora. He later, as an itinerant monk, had also taken Sister Nivedita to speak his mind on the power and glory of the Upanishad and Vedanta. In one such discourse, he had said, I see that India is a young and living organism. Europe also is young and living. In India, we have social communism and the light of Advaita. This is spiritual individualism. In Europe, you are socially individualistic, which is spiritual communism. What? Rise at the expense of another? I didn't come to earth for that. Now we must help the Indian experiment as it is. This is where Nivedita stayed whenever in Almora. She had heard her master thinking aloud on the unities of religions and cultures, the affinities of the East and West, the inner joining of man and nature the mystery of man's soul and the unknowable cosmos. Like the French philosopher Pascal, he could have compared man to the vast universe. What is man? no more than a reed compared to the universe. But the universe does not know itself and cannot know itself without me. Swamiji, during one such conversation with Sister Nivedita in Kashmir, ruefully said, it will need another Vivekananda to understand what this Vivekananda was. This Vivekananda, the world now realizes, was a lonely man traveling in the mysterious universe in search of one single and simple thing, truth. The truth about man. The truth about man's relation to God. This is again one of the places made memorable to posterity by the Swami's sessions of meditation. Kakri Ghat still boasts a pupil tree under which he meditated. By the flowing stream, he sat on one of these rocks a great number of times, meditating, planning, 
arguing with himself and wondering how to make use of his monkhood for the betterment of India. Much before he actually left for the West, he had endeared himself to a great number of Indian aristocrats and intellectuals who urged him to preach about India to the West. The opportunity arrived on the fateful day of September 11, 1893, when he stood before the world, as it were, at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. Public Notice 3, this installation that we have done, is uh, one of the ways in which we are trying to rediscover the message of Swami Vivekananda. Because I think that uh, each generation has to take the message and has to put it in a way that is accessible for that generation. And this contemporary installation, um, which focuses on the message of Swami Vivekananda, um, I think is, has been immensely popular amongst young people who are fascinated by the lights um, because it, it, you know, the words are in these different colors of Homeland Security and um, others are completely transformed by the, the words itself. I mean, the words are so magical and, you know, so poetic. Um, so I think that, you know, it is for every generation to, um, uh, find a relevance and to make the message contemporary. You know, I think uh, we have this tendency in India of putting everyone on a pedestal and then, you know, um, just treating it as something from the past. But in fact, if we can make him relevant today, that's the way we continuously uh, keep him alive and keep him relevant. And Public Notice 3 was a way to uh, make Swami Vivekananda's message in Chicago relevant not only to Chicagoans, but it's relevant throughout the world today. Um, it, it is a speech that really cuts, you know, cuts across all boundaries um, of geography. Um, and it's not just about Hinduism. The speech is such a beautiful speech. Uh, it is so poetic. Um, and uh, it is not just about India. It, it's actually a speech of our times so relevant today in this post 9-11 world. We now introduce you to Swami Vivekananda from India and request him to address us. Swami Vivekananda. Which fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of religions. And I thank you in the name of the millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. My thanks also to some of the speakers on this platform who, referring to the delegates from the Orient, have told you that these men from far off nations may well claim the honor of bearing to different lands the idea of toleration. We have to do our job to ensure that different generations know about Swamiji. Of course, the Vedanta Center is extremely um, 
important in the role that it plays in keeping up the message of Swamiji in America. There are Vedanta centers throughout America. It, it has many followers. Um, and the Indians are increasingly playing a role along with Americans in um, keeping the Vedanta centers alive. Um, the other institution I think that is also playing a great role is uh, the World Parliament of Religions itself. They still exist. They still host world parliaments. And while we have had public notice three at the Art Institute, we've worked with them. Um, um, they have brought interreligious groups and their trustees and um, you know many of their patrons over to the Art Institute to um, you know talk about Swamiji uh, on a regular basis. So all of the institutions uh, do their bit to make sure that people do not forget um, Swamiji's message. And I think uh, it is for all of us and the government of India and the citizens, uh, the Indian Americans particularly need to play a role to ensure that the Swamiji is not forgotten in America. Uh, I think every generation has to rediscover him. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth. I am proud to tell you that we have gathered in our bosom the purest remnant of the Israelites who came to southern India and took refuge with us in the very year in which their holy temple was shattered to pieces by Roman tyranny. I am proud to belong to the religion which has sheltered and is still fostering the remnant of the grand Zoroastrian nation. I report to you, brethren, a few lines from a hymn which I remember to have repeated from my earliest boyhood, which is every day repeated by millions of human beings. As the different streams, having their sources in different places, all mean their water in the sea, so, O oh Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. The applause that punctuated Swamiji's talk thundered out at its close. The people had recognized their hero and had taken him to the hearts. Thenceforward, he was the star of the parliament. At the end of his fourth lecture at the parliament, one great convert to Vedantism was the American intellectual William Ernest Hoking, who wrote years later, For me, this doctrine was a startling departure from anything which my scientific psychology could then recognize. And the man who helped introduce him to the parliament, the redoubtable scholar Professor Wright, could only say, how can we even try to introduce Vivekananda? Do we ask the sun what its right is to light the earth? Swamiji remained in America until August of the year 1895, when he came to Europe for the first time. In September, he found his way to England, and a month or so later, he began teaching in London. Sister Nivedita, in her marvelous memoirs, The Master As I Saw Him, writes, It is strange to remember, and yes, it was sure my good fortune, that though I heard the teachings of my master, the Swami Vivekanando, on both the occasions of his visits to England in 1895 and 1896, I yet knew little or nothing of him in private life until I came to India in the early days of 1898. For, as a fruit of this want of experience, I have it that at each step of his self-revelation as a personality, my master stands out in my memory against his proper background of Indian forest.
city and highway and eastern teacher in an eastern world. Like a host of other Western disciples, Nivedita too realized that Swamiji had every right to proclaim with authority from the Gita. Whenever religion decays and irreligion prevails, then I manifest myself. For the protection of the good, for the destruction of the evil, for the firm establishment of the truth, I am born again and again. It was to establish this truth to the heart of the millions that Swamiji and his brotherhood later developed the Ramakrishna Mission Ashram at Belur. Sheer preaching or learning was not enough. The mission proposed all good thoughts must be translated into action. Well, whenever we say human resource development, it is simply a didactic concept. And this is what Swami Vivekananda told before us. He said that education is the manifestation of the perfection already in man. Practically from the same standpoint, he also said, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already in man. So the resource is already within. We have to be aware of it. We must be equipped with those skills and those ideas by which we can manifest and make the best use of the resources. One of the most impressive forms of teaching practiced by the Swami was silence. In other words, by sheer presence. Having founded the ashram, Swamiji did not have much long to live. He had formed a body of greatly talented servants of India and in the process suffered great bouts of health break. He again started revisiting the places that made him what he was. Varanasi, then Almora, Darjeeling. Nivedita, in her book, recalls a most beautiful journey with the Swamiji to Kheer Bhavani. Everything in our life up to the time of the pilgrimage to Amarnath had been associated with the thought of Shiva. Each step had seemed to draw us closer to the great snow mountains that were once his image and his home. The young moon resting at nightfall above the glacier cleft and the tossing pines had suggested irresistibly the brow of the great God, above all, that world of meditation on whose outskirts we dwelt, had him at his heart and center, wrapped and silent, above all qualities and beyond the reach of salt.
From that time onward, the monks and thereafter the devotees who believe in Ramakrishna, the Vekananda philosophy, they have dedicated themselves to different kinds of activities. Today, you will find 172 centers all over the world. And in India, there are 130 centers, both mod and mission. They are engaged mostly in educational activities and also medical services. And special attention has already been given to the tribals and marginals. There is a big area which has been covered by Ramakrishna Mahatma and Ramakrishna Vishnu. 